morning to everybody and uh, thank you for joining in and welcome to ct expert talks um, before i hand over the mic to our distinguished speaker today just a word or two about channel technologies or ct as we are called and also about uh, our initiative called expert talks so uh, channel technologies is a two decade old uh, marketing services organization and we help our clients uh, build marketing strategies and also then finally help them in implementing those strategies with the objective of demand generation we work uh, primarily in the it space it and telecom space and have a number of international market leaders as our clients uh, ct expert talks is uh, an initiative which we started recently the idea is to get thought leaders like the one we have today to speak on topics that concern everybody and our uh, first such talk was in collaboration uh, earlier with uh, deloitte and it covered the impact of the last uh, budget on taxation uh, today we have the pleasure of uh, introducing mr nalin kumar who's the head of investment banking and wealth advisory for idbi capital uh, which is a subsidiary of uh, idbi bank so uh, mr nalin kumar is a well experienced investment banker and uh, he's having worked in uh, most of the global uh, financial centers with the bulge bracket investment banks during his 28 years experience in the financial services domain uh, mr kumar graduated from iit with honors in chemical engineering and subsequently from iim in finance and marketing he has also completed global programs with hsbc and jp morgan chase in banking and corporate finance respectively at the top of his class he has worked in mumbai new york hong kong and singapore with leading financial services firms like hsbc jp morgan merrill lynch morgan stanley rabo bank where he has had several positions of increasing responsibility including as managing director and head of investment banking services mr kumar leverages on his multi geography and asset class expertise to create balanced least friction structures to focus on creating returns preserving capital and tax efficient intra and intergenerational transfers so today the idea is that our topic is managing investments and particularly in this turbulent state the economy finds itself in and inflation is a major worry for all of us and how to protect our investments in this climate where inflation is, is eroding our investments that is the concern which all of us have and we are proud to have uh, such a distinguished speaker who will give us insights on what has caused this problem and how do we circumvent it and how do we ride over it uh and be successful in protecting our investment so over to you mr nalin kumar and thank you very much for joining us today thank we'll be you. taking questions also at the end of the presentation thank you and over to you uh thank you ajay for giving me the opportunity uh this is a subject which absolutely delights me uh i spend most of my uh day and even at times night uh, thinking about these items so absolutely delighted to present um let me start with just talking about what are the factors which are driving the current market i think most of you who would be uh, clued into the markets know what happened yesterday which was the fed uh, meeting where uh, powell hike rates by 75 basis points this 75 basis points hike has been the largest hike delivered by the fed since 1994 so we are talking about almost a 30 year period in which you've had the largest hike we've been living in ultra easy monetary conditions and uh, because of the very tight uh, labor markets and the supply bottlenecks uh, inflation in the us has gone way above the fed 
expectation or management zone of 2%. It has been 8% and 10%. So for a long time, the Fed kept saying or kept thinking, and perhaps rightly, that this was temporary and supply-induced inflation, which would go away. But many factors have happened since, and this has not gone away. In fact, inflation in the United States is in double digits. So mind you, their target is 2%. Inflation is more than 10%. That's a huge gap to bridge. And that is causing all these decisions and is causing the dislocations in the market, which is in turn created a challenge for our own markets. We'll come back to our own markets in due course. But right now, I'm just going to focus on uh, the global market. So US inflation, we talked about. Consequently, interest rates have to rise. We're currently living in a negative interest rate uh, environment. Negative interest rate environments tend to hurt the savers of capital. So they tend not to save. And that in turn has further problems for the economy. So USA inflation is on the rise, US interest rates are on the rise. Um, coming to the next point on potential recession in USA. See what happens when uh, you have interest rates going up, <clears throat> uh, there is a curtailment of demand. When there is a curtailment of demand, there is a potential of a recession. Recessions are generally seen as not good situations of the economy. And the greatest effort has always been made by Fed and all other central bankers to make sure that we do not have a hard landing and we have a soft landing. A soft landing essentially is interest rates go up, but the economy doesn't go down. The risk that many of the economists now are talking about is that there is a hard landing and the US economy goes into a recession. If the US economy were to go into a recession, then it curbs demand for a lot of commodities, it curbs demand for goods and services, and it is generally negative for the world because the US is the largest economy in the world. Um, the next point I put out is quantitative easing, a tightening instead of easing. You see, we've had the longest period of quantitative easing in the world, right since 2008, post the Lehman crisis, the Fed has been keeping ultra loose monetary policy, and they have also been buying bonds of all kinds, and they have increased their balance sheet to a level which has never happened in the past. So while it was always clear that this had to reverse, uh, this kept going on for an extremely long period of time because for whatever reason, successive Fed, Feds felt that it was not the right time to pull back the easy money. Now they've got to the point where they started to pull back easy money. I think Powell said that they would shrink the balance sheet and increase interest rates. So both these happening at the same time has impacted the world. And consequently, money due to easy policies, which had been spread across the world in what is called the risk on trade, money went into emerging markets, including India, over an extended decade period, uh, is now going back to the US. So what you're seeing is US investors in particular, but global investors also, selling off emerging markets, using the, the proceeds, to pay down the leverage that they had created. And that is also resulting in the US dollar going up significantly. The other factor which is driving the market is that all the regions of the world have been running on a very low interest rate uh, regime. Uh, Europe had many countries which were into negative interest rates. Japan has had negative interest rates or zero interest rates for now more than two decades. It's an extremely long period. In fact, it's a generation which has seen only um, low interest rates. Um, and most of the world is this way. So India used to be a very high interest rate economy. 
but even India has brought down the interest rate structure in the economy. All regions in the world are aligned except China. China was has cut back rates while others are increasing rates in the near term. Consequence is going to be felt in the effects between China and the rest of the world. Uh, we've had serious supply side disruptions over the last two years. Uh, COVID has been an event like never before and the world has really struggled to cope with it. Uh, there were several supply side disruptions which happened, which have really tested the global supply chains. And a lot of countries have come to the conclusion that global supply chains can't work, or at least they need to look at alternate supply chains. Now you see what has happened in China over the last two months, China has pretty much kept a zero tolerance for COVID. So they have locked down Beijing, Shanghai, and their ports are struggling. So um, the, the kind of supply side disruption that has come in from China is huge. And because China had become the manufacturing location of the world over the last three decades, we got into a situation where um, goods are not getting to various parts of the world because shipping has almost got stuck. So there are containers that are just locked up in, uh, in China. This has exacerbated the uh, inflation in global markets. There has also been a productivity loss due to alternate supply chains. The In the last decade or two, the supply chain had got very, very uh, efficient because uh, you know China had become the manufacturing location of the world. And as a consequence, there were a lot of efficiencies which came in which kept inflation low, interest rates low, and you know, kept the world in very good economic conditions. This has changed as the world is trying to look for alternate supply chains. Uh, and there's a productivity loss. So once again, inflation has gone up because of that. If all these factors were not enough, we had a war in Ukraine, which has resulted in soft and hard commodities getting impacted. See, Russia and Ukraine between them were major exporters of, uh, of soft commodities, that is in agriculture, including wheat, and hard commodities in the form of uranium, coal, oil. Uh, if you see what has happened between February 24th, when uh, Putin invaded Ukraine, and now, uh, oil prices have moved up uh, by a multiple factor. Uh, coal has gone up, uh, wheat has gone up, all agri commodities have gone up, and that has led to huge inflation across the world. India has also hiked rates due to inflation and to protect the currency. So these are the factors which have been driving the current market. I'll now move into what is happening in the India situation. Okay. India, we've seen relentless selling by the FIIs. Uh, more than $22 billion of equity has been sold by FIIs since uh, November of 21. This has been the single largest pace of selling by the FIIs ever in India. In fact, if you actually look at it, uh, this is the cumulative positive FII money that came in over a long period of time. So this kind of um, sale by FII in a different scenario would have probably caused the market to drop 30 or 40%. Why has this not happened? This has not happened because the FII selling has been balanced by SIPs. There have been new investors who've come in. There have been older investors who've reallocated from debt to equity. The market conditions in India also uh, changed over a period of time as interest rates started coming down in India. The options for investors in India to be in fixed income came down. So bank deposits were no longer attractive post-tax. Uh, debt funds were no longer attractive post-tax. 
Um, so investors were pretty much left with no choice but to move money into other asset classes. Gold has not been performing, real estate went through a multi-decade low. So a lot of money came into equity. In fact, if you see uh, in the last 18 months, uh, there has been uh, a fourfold increase in the number of new investors that have got added on. This is the largest pace of new investor addition. A lot of the new investors are also the younger uh, people. They are people who were working from home. In a work from home scenario, uh, there was a lot more time available and people were also able to manage their portfolios in addition to doing whatever work from home was required. So this has moved a lot of capital into equity. India started with a very low base. So it was only 2% of people who were investing into equity. It has now gone up to 5%. Uh, there's still a lot of room, but as you can see, the growth has been fairly, fairly rapid. Uh, in addition, we have seen the movement of money from pension funds into equity. So the popular EPF, PPF, et cetera, they, a decade ago did not invest into equity at all. But as interest rates in India started coming down, and in order to maintain the payout in the 8 to 10% zone, uh, the pension funds have moved money into equity. Now, at this point, there is an allocation of fresh, 15% of fr fresh portfolio goes into equity. There is a talk to increase that to 25%, which means that there will be continued money, which is going to go into the equity slabs. Uh, real estate has been in a 10 year slump. You know, real estate prices moved up fairly quickly in the decade from 2000 to 2008. And then it's been on a downward trend. So many investors being savvy, they did not put too much money, new incremental money into real estate. What went into real estate was primarily the old uh, commitments that had been made. So with a real estate slump, what happened was a lot of investment had to now start thinking of where it goes. Uh, historically, uh, almost 70% of India's uh, wealth is in a gold and real estate. And a gold was also not, not doing very well. A gold was not doing very well because of global factors also. And because of the fact that cash in the system was declining. Historically, gold and real estate had very high cash components in them. With cash in the system declining, both these asset classes received lesser inflows. And that resulted in a slump in both of these sectors. So you had a very uh, interesting scenario where uh, per force investors had to move into equity. And you've seen what happened in the last 18 month period. The other uh, big trend was that India became the largest crypto investor base. Uh, you know, it, it is uh, despite RBI's efforts to keep a control uh, India has still got the largest crypto investor base. And this investor base has seen serious losses because the peak of uh, the Bitcoin, the most tracked cryptocurrency was 65,000 US dollars per Bitcoin. And that's trading in the range of $20,000 uh, per Bitcoin as we speak, which, which means that it's down by almost two thirds. That's a serious destruction in value. And this is going to have serious consequences for a lot of investors who didn't understand what they were getting into. China, on the other hand, made uh, crypto practically illegal. They made sure that crypto mining cannot happen in China. And pretty much everything was pushed out of China. So they have managed to curtail their losses from the crypto trades. India has also seen a lot of formalization of the economy post GST. So by formalization, what I mean is that large has become larger. Uh, the bigger companies who were paying GST have, and had systems in place have found it easier to get new business, whereas the smaller players 
who were not uh, not paying GST, who were efficient because they were outside of the tax net, now have a problem because the increase in taxes are making sure that their profitability has got wiped out. So this has been a major structural driver. So if you see amongst the things I talked about, the two big steps that Mr. Narendra Modi has taken, one is attempting to clean out the cash from the system, and the second is implementation of GST, have both had far-reaching impact on where the country stands and where it's directionally oriented to go. Um, India has several structural positives, and we are probably sitting in a country today which has never been better in the period post-independence. Uh, it, it is an amazing time to be alive in India. The opportunity set is huge. Uh, people will get great opportunities in the next decade and two. And most people should try and make sure that they capitalize on this opportunity. What are the structural positives that I see? One, there has been a reduction in the interest rate structure. This is long-term positive. India was non-competitive on cost of capital. It is still more expensive than the rest of the world, but the gap has declined. Because India was non-competitive on the capital side, uh, it was very difficult for Indian companies to invest into manufacturing and be competitive on a global scale. This is changing. Uh, again, after COVID, uh, most of the Western world has decided they want to follow a China plus one strategy. So it gives India a huge opportunity. You know, the, these opportunities don't have to play out in six months. But if we took a three to five year scenario, I think the kind of growth India is going to see and catering to the world is going to be immense. The government has also made a lot of effort for uh, PLI and uh, P, uh, the P, uh, production linked incentives which will have a huge impact positively on manufacturing as well as employment. India has the largest working force, uh, working age workforce, which again is a huge positive and we can supply to the whole world. As, as the populations in Western Europe, uh, Japan, Germany, et cetera, are getting to the age where they can't work anymore, India can support that. So we have to capitalize on this. Further, the biggest gain that will come out to India will be the product, potential reduction on oil dependence via renewable power in the form of solar, wind, electric, as well as electric cars. So India's biggest uh, foreign exchange usage has been towards oil, and it has been Con continuously taking in India downwards because oil co prices have been going up and consumption has been going up and India has not been finding any oil of its own. So this has resulted in a huge dependence on oil and a consequent um, currency uh, depreciation. So if we look at these four factors, uh, there are several others, but you know these are the key ones. Reduction in interest rates, the China plus one strategy, efforts for PLI, and potential reduction on oil depend in, uh, dependence. India is actually going to be positioned very, very positively in the decade to follow. Let me take a look at what is the implication of all of this. We talked about the global situation. We talked about the India situation, the positives and the negatives. And we'll talk a little bit about what happens to the various asset classes. We'll start with equity. Equity is likely to remain subdued till earnings upcycle comes about. Okay, uh, It's not clear that we'll see an up earnings upcycle in the short term. Uh, but India could be an economy which is delinked from the world because of a large consumption. Over the last uh, couple of years, uh, then you can actually see earnings increases, consumption demand increasing. This may be possible because some of the agri commodities have gone up in price. 
So if if that follow on effect comes into the Indian economy, the farmers will have more income, rural income will go up, and consumption in rural India will be on a upswing. There will be a certain set of industries which are positively benefited by this. Uh, the second factor on equity is selling in large cap will continue via the FIIs. At this point, it appears that FED is on a continual uh, interest rate hike cycle. Powell in his statements yesterday has pretty much said that the next rate hike in July will also be potentially 75 basis points. He's kept the room between 50 and 75 basis points. He's also said that it will be data driven. So uh, one may actually see anything between 50 and 100 basis points. That's going to be a very, very major factor. So July uh, FOMC meeting is going to be very deterministic on the way forward. Till the rates keep going up, the chances that FIIs continue to sell is high. Uh, the chances that they will sell in uh, the larger stocks is much higher because there is more liquidity in the large cap stocks. Um, what is the view on fixed income? Fixed income is likely to see some inflows uh, simply because the interest rates are going to go up in India and you're going to see a relative underperformance in equity. Equity outperformance was huge in the years 2020 and 2021. We're not going to see that kind of uh, performance again uh, for, for a period of time. But that doesn't mean that you have to have a negative equity performance. It's just that equities will not perform the way they had in the past. So fixed income inflows are going to be a function of the extent of rate hikes and uh, the extent of equity underperformance. What's the view on real estate? Real estate could see some gains because we've seen a decade of stagnancy in re uh, real estate. But this is also, there are mega trends happening wherein the younger generation does not have the mindset of ownership. We are moving towards the willingness to see um, a shared economy. You see uh, shared workspaces, uh, sh uh, you know, uh, desire to own assets have come down. We have uh, Ola and Uber, which is working very well. So ownership of uh, even vehicles is coming down. Um, this this is a trend which needs to be understood relative to uh, how the older generation used to look at asset ownership. So it is possible that real estate may do well, but not as well as it did in the past. It's also possible that the cash component in real estate starts coming down. Uh, gold. Uh, gold is India's hidden wealth between India and China. Uh, household gold is uh, pretty dominant and these two countries hold much of the gold there's there's a lot of action which is going to happen at the currency level uh, crypto doesn't seem to be taking that uh, position as it was thought for a bit so gold could potentially come back if the gold standard comes in then frankly gold can go up a lot and that would be india's hidden wealth India's wealth would go up manifold. Uh, there are certain commodities which will see growth. Uh, copper is one of them. Uh, steel could be another. Steel is currently impacted because the, um, the cycles uh, have, uh, have been reversed with the government putting in export duties to cool down steel prices. Uh, same thing will happen with copper, but copper is required for electric vehicles in a much bigger way. It's required for uh, wires, for construction, and uh, the amount of copper in the world is small and it's not increasing. So this is one commodity which will do extremely well on a three to five year period. We talked about the other asset class which India has got very excited about, which is crypto. Crypto uh, is going through intense volatility. We've got to see where it, uh, you know eventually settles but it's not going to see the kind of huge run-up it had seen in the past and frankly a lot of cryptocurrencies will just pretty much die like what happened with luna uh, there's an opportunity for 
alternate asset classes, that is the AIFs to come up. Uh, of course, the mutual funds will be a way for investing. Um, sorry. Yeah, uh, let me talk a little bit about the sectors which will work. The sectors which will work will be the export oriented sectors. That's the tech and uh, enterprise tech startups, uh, auto ancillaries, pharma, anything in the China plus one play, uh, which could be textiles. Um, domestic consumption basket should do very well. There will be a short term in inflation impact on the margins, but uh, that's likely to be um, low in the longer term. So those companies can do well. Two wheeler and electric vehicles should do well. Uh, the power sector should be a defensive sector. Uh, domestic consumption should be visible in the consumer tech sector. Uh, E-commerce and retail should do well. Electronics manufacturing should do well. The chemical sector, again, has India has a huge opportunity to be a global supplier of the chemicals. Defensives would be telecom and power uh, in a very highly volatile environment. That concludes the initial thoughts that I had. We can always come back to specific sectors if uh, the, uh, the audience would like to hear more. Uh, but I'm happy to take questions from here. Yeah, I see one question uh, from Madhusudan, which says, which type of debt asset class category funds can be used now in this scenario to park money? So in a rising interest rate scenario, you have to look at uh, short duration funds or funds that can reprice. Uh, so the best thing to be doing is being in the absolutely short end, which is the zero to 30 days. You could also take a little bit more risk if you want to uh, get a slightly higher yield pickup. The 32, uh, sorry, the zero to 90 day period could also work, but you really need to be at the very short end. The other way to play fixed income is to go into uh, duration funds wherein the, they roll off. So funds which buy specific period papers. So let us say they bought a paper for three years and they don't reinvest that, it rolls off. So the roll off strategy could also work uh, because there's a, a YTM and you hold it to maturity. Okay, so these are the two strategies which would work in a rising interest rate environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the next question is with the markets correcting almost 12% from previous peak, is a lump sum approach or still staggered allocation to equity work? So that's an excellent question. Um, I think the market showing a 12% correction from the peak is only still in the large caps. The mid and small caps have corrected a lot more in general. Uh, having said that, it's generally going to be more of a bottom-up approach over the next 12-month uh, period for sure in terms of the stocks to buy. It's not going to be a continually rising market and you buy anything and it will go up. Um, so uh, one has to be extremely select selective in terms of the stocks that one picks up. Also, uh, the question on whether a lump sum or a standard allocation to equity uh, I think in this environment, a uh, staggered allocation will definitely be better than a lump sum approach because we have not yet seen the bottom of the market, which means that if you put all the money in right now, the chances that it would go down is reasonably high. So that's a risk that is not advisable to take, uh, except for uh, people who are in the market 24-7. Um, it's much better to take a staggered allocation to equity. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious, uh, 
to know. Uh, you said that you know these uh, FIIs have sold out. Uh, where have they yes. now gone? Where has all that money been taken to? So this is a very interesting uh, point. You see, what is happening in the world is there was an expansion of capital over the last decade. Mm -hmm. Capital just kept increasing. Uh, the mm -hmm. Fed created money, uh, new money. It bought a lot of bonds. It ex expanded its balance sheet. And so there were a lot of debt issuances which happened, particularly in the United States, but across the world. These debt issuances, this balance sheet expansion, in turn, was triggered into emerging markets. So the whole world saw a whole lot of capital expansion and growth. What is now happening is the reverse. Uh, this expansion and growth is, is being replaced by contraction. What that means is some of these bonds, etc., that were being issued are just going to be held in the, are going to be canceled out. So what that means is that there's going to be a reduction in capital. So, you know, the answer to your question on what's happening to the money is it is actually just going to disappear. And disappearance by itself is not bad, but that also means that it's coming off in the assets and all asset classes. In fact, if you see, this is the one time where all asset classes have come off. There's almost no asset class which is uh, doing well, which basically shows that this is a liquidity induced uh, correction. So I don't know if I've managed to answer your question, uh, but the res uh, reality is there's going to be a lot less capital uh, at the institutional level. And because of the interest rate hikes and what's going to happen uh, from demand destruction and potential recession, uh, that the balance sheets of the household sector is also going to be impacted. So across the board, you're going to see lesser and lesser capital available for investing. This difficult scenario to look at uh, and little unfortunate to happen at this point in time. But uh, the world goes through its cycles, the markets go through their cycle, and unfortunately, we are in the downward cycle at this point in time. Right, thank you. I, uh, one more question. I know it's um, an oversimplification, but if I was to ask that, you know, if somebody had 100 rupees uh, to invest, what would be the proportion he should put in which asset class? So, so that's actually a very tough question to answer. And it is not a one size fits all. It tends to be fairly specific. Yes, on it the depends person. on the age of the person. Yeah, yes. it depends on the age of the person. It depends on the life cycle stage. Um, you know, it depends on the income generation capability of the person, education background, just lots of factors go into it. Uh, but and keeping in mind that equity will, over the longer term, outperform, a higher percentage should go into equity. So if we just use the United States as a benchmark on a 30 to 40 year period, equity returns have been mm -hmm. order of magnitude 11%. Okay, uh, The debt returns order of magnitude have been five or 6%. Okay, The gold returns, in US dollars have been order of magnitude, again, 5% uh, CAGR. Okay. Real estate is much more difficult to judge, uh, but returns in real estate have been higher. Uh, so depending on whether you include your primary real estate, that's your home, into the mix, or you keep it out, uh, the ratio can move quite significantly. So I would say uh, as rule of thumb for somebody who's between the age of say uh, 30 and 40, okay, 50% uh, allocation to equity is reasonable. 
and the balance would be split amongst the other asset classes. So I would say 25% to 30% would be in fixed income and uh, a gold uh, would take 10%, real estate would take 10% to 20%, uh, depending on the person and uh, the risk appetite and the kind of real estate assets they found. Remember, real estate is relatively illiquid, except if you go through REITs. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, you have to kind of create a uh, portfolio which balances return, liquidity and risk. And that tends to generally be specific for each person and it can't be a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But coming to real estate, um, you mentioned that you still expect a certain amount of buoyancy and uh, to return to the earlier, uh, you know, appreciation. But at the same time, I hear the extent of unsold inventory in real estate is so huge that that itself uh, would be a deterrent, right? And also the fact that, you know, there have been so many cases recently of, uh, you know, uh, people losing their savings, which has also uh, now uh, made people very, very wary of putting their money into real, real estate. I know RERA has come, but it is still to take on and still to prove itself. So do you still think that it will continue to rise or now those days are gone completely? So... You know, I think uh, uh, crystal ball gazing is always an uh, exercise uh, of difficulty. And uh, all the points that you've made are absolutely valid against real estate. And that is why real estate has seen a slump. So you've had a decade over which um, there is a huge unsold inventory because people are simply not buying. And when people are not buying, the last bit of the construction is left open. So there, there are many ghost buildings. You know, if you look at China, there are entire ghost cities. India doesn't have it to that extent, but absolutely right, particularly uh, NCR or uh, even OMR, Chennai, some parts of Bangalore, Pune, there's huge overbuild that has happened. Now, why do I think that it will not be as bad as it's been in the last decade? One, RERA brings in a lot, lot of comfort. Where, where did people lose their money? People generally lost their money in projects where they invested in very early stage, which was probably at the land level or when just, just at the point where approvals had got cleared and construction had not started. Typically, real estate, depending on the height of the building, uh, is a two to five year uh, process. Most of the buildings in uh, skyscrapers in, in uh, Mumbai, where I come from, uh, generally take at least five years to, uh, to build. So the period is very long and a lot of things go wrong in a five year period. So real estate will always be a slightly riskier asset class. Uh, but keep in mind that the cost of commodities has gone up very substantially. So the construction cost in the last decade has gone up. Now that construction cost has to eventually be paid by the end consumer. So just the cost of the product has gone up. And for that reason, it's going to be more difficult for prices to stay low. Uh, so there has to be a, a move up now. The question is whether people will buy or not. And I think there will be a move towards attempting to buy property which is already built as a secondary trade or which is about to get completed. You see, if you are in a six month prior to completion, that's probably a time when uh, this could uh, real estate could work. And it also depends on the mindset of the individuals, whether they see a desire to hold uh, asset that they uh, for living because many people are now into relatively more mobile jobs so they don't always want to hold an asset so there are many many factors which are at play again it becomes a little bit more specific to the individual 
I think we are going to be better uh, than where we were in the last uh, decade, uh, but maybe it will not go back to the period of 2004 to 2008, where real estate moved up uh, very, very rapidly. Right, thank you very much. We'll take one last question. Of course, we can go on and on with the, the excellent inputs we are getting, but we'll stick to one question. So Mr. Madhusudan is asking, on AIF, is these new age investing in unlisted or pre-IPO companies a good idea, considering many startups falter? Also, considering the fund size of minimum one crore set by SEBI, is it not a big risk on capital? So let me answer the second part of the question first. Uh, it is a big risk on capital. There's no question about it. And therefore, SEBI has largely said that they don't want the retail average retail investor to uh, get into this. They want only uh, investors with a lot more capital who understand the situation to be willing to get into this. So AIFs have clearly been uh, created for the slightly wealthier set who can take losses, their capacity for bearing losses higher. Uh, so I think SEBI has been uh, very good in doing this. It's the standard qual uh, qualified uh, qualified buyer approach that is there across the world. Most parts of the world, there is the threshold limit in the United States, for instance. It's 250,000 US dollars to be able to invest into some of these asset classes which are not available to the retail public. Generally, what happens is these asset classes tend to have a higher return uh, because they are not, uh, you know, given across the board. So uh, size, size wise, it, it is not a big risk if the person has adequate capital. If he doesn't have capital, obviously, it's a very big risk. The first part of your question, which is uh, the new age investing in unlisted or pre-IPOs, is it a good idea? Uh, the answer is, you know, each of these investments have a, a point in the cycle when they can be very attractive. So the pre-IPO and the unlisted space or even the IPO space was very attractive in the last 12 month period. Uh, or if we pulled out the last six months in the 12 months prior to that, and many IPOs gave great returns. Uh, that is definitely gone in a rising interest rate environment. So in my, my general guidance would be that doing unlisted companies or pre-IPO companies at this point in time is not very good. Also, the startup risk is going to go up very substantially because the venture capital folks have decided that uh, funding of many of these startups is not positive. So the entire early stage system and the startup system is going to face a much harsher uh, climate going forward. So yes, it is a tough uh, area to invest in and it is not a good idea if one does not have uh, substantial capital. SEBI has tried to create a floor with one uh, crore but the reality is that one's net worth should be many times that to be able to or be willing to take that kind of a risk. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, there's just one more quick question. In which sector to invest in order to get the best returns? So uh, it's, it's difficult to answer that. The sectors keep changing. Uh, depending on relative valuation and uh, the relative dynamics, which keep changing over time. In the last one and a half years, the tech sector did extremely well because digitization increased. Um, globally, India has a competitive advantage in this sector. We have a knowledge base, which is, which is very good. Uh, and uh, we contribute to uh, digitization and tech sector across the world. So my view is that sector will continue to do well. Maybe it will not do as well as it did in the last uh, 18 months, 
but it's a sector which will do very well. Uh, the other sectors which will do well are those which are reliant on knowledge. Uh, India has smart people. If we can organize those people in a good way, uh, you know, we can we can have a competitive advantage to the world. I see that advantage coming in the biotech area and in research oriented areas relating to the pharma industry. So there are very few companies in this particularly who are listed, but uh, those could uh, give you outsized returns over a period of time. The other theme which should work is the consumption space. India has one of the largest populations and uh, therefore as consumption comes in, um, these, uh, these consumption companies will do well. So these would be my three bets. Um, I wouldn't say single sector at this point in time, but if we looked at a five-year horizon and if you split your money uh, across these sectors, uh, you are likely to outperform the market. Yeah, you did mention that the liquidity in the rural sector will go up, which would also mean that the consumption space should see good returns. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think the, the rural space has not kicked in for the last three years and that's one big engine that is available to drive the indian economy the good news on the indian economy is we are not dependent on single sectors and there are large pockets multiple diversified pockets of demand um, i think india really stands at the crossroads of a very very sustained uh, increase in the market valuations Wow, that's that's the right positive note to end on. So thank you so much, uh, Nalin. We were you've been talking about wealth, and I can tell you, you've given a wealth of information to everybody today. So it's been thank you, so delight, nice and enriching. It's been yeah. really enriching for everybody, and thanks a lot to you for all this time and the information you shared. And I'm sure each of our uh, listeners has had a a great time in absorbing all the insights given by you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you for having me on your channel. Uh, delighted and happy to uh, keep engaged. And uh, if there are any further questions, happy to take them up also at a later point. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, listeners. And bye-bye. Bye-bye.